Hi guys, we're back and today the topic for discussion is uh, bowel obstruction and not just that, things like uh, TPN which is uh, nutrition that a patient would expect to have after they've had something like a bowel obstruction. So let's get started. Let's face take a look at Marsha who has just ordered lunch in a restaurant. She's now having abdominal cramps. She has a long history of constipation. Soon she will be um, diagnosed with a bowel obstruction. Obstruction of the bowel can either be the small or large bowel and may occur for a number of reasons. I mean we can go on and on but I don't have them all. I just try to round off some of the most common ones. Tumors, constipation, Crohn's disease, adhesions from previous surgeries. Yes, from previous surgeries sometimes that scar tissue can cause people to have obstructions. Uh, impaction caused by feces, yes. Some people who have constipation, you get impacted with feces, that in itself can cause an obstruction. An obstruction may occur either in the small or large bowel, either of the above. Now we're going to talk about something called paralytic ileus. And the causes are by post-operative complication, abdominal surgery, and the use of narcotics. Certain narcotics can cause them because they slow the bowel down. Um, Alice had surgery three days ago. She calls her nurse complaining of abdominal discomfort. And this is a biggie after patients have had surgery. Uh, typically we check for bowel sounds. We do an abdominal assessment, check for bowel sounds a day or two or so. Make sure they have bowel sounds returned because if they don't, there's a good chance that something else has to be done. The signs and symptoms would include abdominal pain, if you have a, a paralytic ileus, of course, uh, abdominal distension, absent bowel sounds. If you took the stethoscope and put it against the abdomen, it's more than likely you would not hear that normal gurgling that when you hear, you know, the bowel sounds. Nausea and vomiting. This is pretty probably about two, three days later. No bowel sounds, abdominal distension, uh, nausea and vomiting. Not a healthy sign at all. Intervention would include, of course, you assess, and then you'd have to let the doctor know, and x-rays and CT scans can be done to diagnose it. And the doctor decides what he, how he wants to treat it, probably a nasogastric tube and whatever else he orders. I want to talk about parenteral tube feeding, uh, total parenteral nutrition. And there are occasions when patients are not able to eat and drink the normal way. Some of them have had abdominal surgery, uh, problems with the bowel, sometimes it might be due to trauma. There are many different reasons why people cannot eat and drink. One thing is clear, if you cannot eat and drink, you still need nutrition. In the case of this patient, Melissa, she was involved in a car accident and sustained abdominal injuries and developed a peritonitis, unable to eat and drink. So TPN is ordered. And TPN is usually given in a sterile solution. A pharmacy usually takes care of mixing it up. A filter is usually added to the IV tubing. And it's usually changed per your unit's protocol. I'm not going to get into that. Complications may include infection, elevated blood sugar, and venous thrombosis. Typically when patients are on TPN, their blood glucose is usually checked to make sure that they're not getting too much sugar. So sometimes it may need adjusting the uh, whatever pr the doctor ordered to be put in the TPN. Now we have this patient who is dreaming of a nice hamburger. Not so, because he's about to have an enteral uh, feeding down. An enteral feeding is when you have a nasogastric tube is usually put through the nose and put into the stomach. On occasion in trauma, I've seen it pass through the mouth too. Not very comfortable, but I've seen it done. Now there are some tubes that go into the stomach and there's some of them that go past the stomach into the jejunum. Typically if it goes into the stomach then one checks for residuals per MD orders. If it goes in the jejunum then it's past the stomach. Generally you don't check and you don't get residuals. However, regardless of what I say, I do ask that you check your institution's policies and procedures and doctor's orders and you proceed from there, whatever the doctor orders, because I don't work in every institution.